welcome to the Film Geezers Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Film Geezers, I'm Robbo and I'm joined as always by Cheeto. Hello. And today is going to be part two of our last episode uh, on directors. This is where we go through a list of directors and choose, try and choose our favourite three films from those. So we might as well just get on with it. Yep. Straight in with um, probably I think one of the most prolific directors that we've um, covered and that's Alfred Hitchcock. Yep. So if I just go through some of his credits and we're not going to go through every every one of them. Mm. Man Who Knew Too Much, 39 Steps, Secret Agents, Sabotage, Lady Vanishes, Direct J. Maker in Rebecca, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Suspicion, Saboteur, Shadow of a Doubt, Lifeboat, um, Spellbound, Notorious, Rope, uh, On the Capricorn, Stage Fright, Strange on the Train, I Confess, Dial M for Murder, Rear Window to Catch a Thief, Trouble with Heinrich, The Man Who Knew Too Much Again, The Wrong Man, Vertigo, North by Northwest, Psycho, <laughs> The Birds, Marnie, Tonka and Topaz, Frenzy, family plot so yeah very i mean there's so many before that as well yeah. so obviously started in 1922 in um i think in silent films mm. in england and then obviously most of his work's been done in america and obviously most of the work that he's actually known for was done in america and in between that he also had his own tv series which was alfred hitchcock presents where he actually directed it ran for six years and he actually directed 17 episodes himself as well as introducing the actual show so what more can you yeah. say <laughs> you want to start yeah, yeah sure yeah. Um, I think it was very hard to try and whittle it down to three but um, I've my first film was Vertigo yeah and uh if I'll just explain Virgo. Um, Jimmy Stewart is the main character. He's um, a detective that, that struggles with Virgo, hence the name. And uh, he he's assigned to like um, do some like detective work on an old friend's wife, played by King Novak. And it's hard because it's hard to explain without not giving the film away. But um, I think this is one of his most revered works, isn't it? Um, I don't know if it's on your list. No, it's not on no. my list, no. Um, but I think uh, Jimmy Stewart puts in an uh, absolute brilliant performance and it was probably the... F I don't know if I'm right in saying this, it was probably the first film to really show sort of vertigo on screen and I think Jimmy Stewart does a brilliant performance in, in showing that physically and it also, like, it's a pioneer of the classic... Mm. Um, I don't know what the shot the shot you call it yeah I know what you mean yeah the overhead kind of um, cinematography by Robert Burks which I think he, he pioneered that kind of mm. whole because it actually makes you feel like you've yeah, got yeah you've got vertigo yeah vertigo yeah but like I said it's hard to try and explain it without trying to give a, give much away because yeah. without Alfred Hitchcock's films you just got to watch them yourself don't you but yes it's well known as one of his best is I'd say one of his masterpieces um one of the best sort of detective crime thrillers um, without giving too much away yeah uh, Jimmy Stewart as always puts in a brilliant performance and just the fact that it just does show you physically what Vertigo feels mm -hmm. like you know and it's a re there's a reason why it's so revered as, as an absolute yeah. masterpiece I think in the British film I believe it's the BFI they rated it the, be the best film of all time yeah and you know um, that's a high accolade, isn't it? So, <laughs> and it's got like an iconic poster, hasn't it? Yeah, which very was iconic. designed by Saul Bass, um, and that kind of is just tells you the story, anyway, doesn't it? Yeah, and the, the Vertigo thing. Music again by Bernard um, Bernard Herman, Herman yeah. who yeah. he would work on in, in later films. So yeah, um, it's just an absolute masterpiece. And once again, with, with Alfred Hitchcock films, you just got to watch them yourself, don't yeah. you, and experience it fully because oh, yeah. this is the most bare bones, just absolute brilliant cinema you can watch, yeah. and yeah, it's one of his best best pieces of art ever made. So that's why it's mm. on my list. Okay, my uh, first one is Strange on the Train. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, it's about two guys who, as it says, they <laughs> meet, meet on a train. Both of them have got somebody that they want to get rid of. One of them, Bruno Anthony, wants to get rid of his father. 
tennis player Guy Haynes wants to um, get rid of his wife so he can marry um, uh, freak so he's free to marry his, his sort of lover mm. um, so Guy dismisses it but Bruno actually goes ahead and kills um, Guy's wife and then when Guy sort of balks at, at, at murdering Bruno's father Bruno makes it clear that he will, he's going to plant evidence to implicate Guy in the murder um, and he's also made some threats about uh, Guy's intended wife Miriam um, and it, it's got an iconic scene at the end in a fairground I don't know if you've I've seen, not it. seen it right, no. yeah so yeah I just think it's 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 a great film it's, yeah. again it's, it's suspense it's tension um, it deals with like quite an unsavoury um, at that time I mean this is the 50s mm. um, subject matter which I think Hitchcock wasn't shy uh, about doing um, so I just think and it's, it's it's one film that's been sort of often parodied and yeah. copied um, most notably in, in I think the Billy, Billy Crystal movie Throw Mama from the Train that was kind of a comedy yeah. update of, of that kind of story so yeah, that's my nice one. Very good one. Good start. Like yeah. I said, with Hitchcock, he's got loads of great movies done. Yeah. So um, my second, I don't, I don't know if you have it. It's Rear Window. Yeah, and Rear Window. Um, it stars uh, Jimmy Stewart once again because mm. I believe they worked frequently together. And he's um, he has an injury, done that he's recovering Broke from his leg. Yeah, yeah, and he, he's bored basically, and he decides to just become a bit of a peeping tom, doesn't well, he? Well, voyeuristic, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's also got Grace Kelly in as well. But yeah. um, the basic plot is he's just like I said, with, he's got his binoculars and he's he's looking around. And um, I don't know if you want to take it. He so well, he, he thinks he thinks he's witnessed a murder. murder yeah. So then, obviously, not able to leave his apartment. He enlists the help of his girlfriend, played by Grace Kelly, yeah. to actually try and investigate for him. Um, and like you said once again, yeah. the, the thing with Alfred Hitchcock's films is suspense. Well, it's got builds, suspense again. Yeah, tension. Yeah. Um, I believe they actually built that set because it's set, sort of like in a courtyard, isn't mm. it, with buildings? And so I think they actually built that as a set. Yeah. As well. Um, but again, yeah, it, it just like I said, you, you just got to watch these movies yourself because they're absolute masterpieces. But um, like like we said before, it, it's suspenseful. It builds on that dread, that that tension, which is just so quintessentially yeah. again cinematography by Robert Burks um, so they must have frequented yeah. together then music by Franz Waxman so obviously not, not Bernard Herrmann no. this time but yeah it, it does I mean um, again you just got to watch it yeah like so we don't do any spoilers here so <laughs> it's very difficult to explain mm. but yeah it is an absolute masterpiece in, in sort yeah. of that those films that just build absolute tension yeah. right so uh, my last one, which is probably your last one, mm. Psycho. Yep. Um, Who saw this coming? Then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably like you. You say Hitchcock, and you. You just everybody. I think. Um, That's his magnum opus, really, it is. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's it's basically about a because this kind of. I thought I was probably going to spoil it anyway. Um, mm. It's based on a novel by Robert Block, and I, I believe that the studios weren't particularly didn't want him to make this film because of the subject matter. Yeah. Um, it obviously it deals with sort of um, serial killers, um, people who are sort of um, psychologically unhinged, and at that time in the sixties, it was kind of um, something that wasn't hadn't been really explored that much. Uh, I believe the character of Anthony um, of Norman Bates is based on Ed Gein, who is a okay, um, yeah. serial killer, mm. and apparently Ed Gein murdered people, buried them, and then he, he used their skin to actually make or use their bodies to actually make things like yeah. he, he use skin to make lamps and shades and things like that so that kind of leads you into what this film's about so it opens up essentially with um, uh, Marion Crane played by Janet Lee stealing I think it's $50,000 from where she works and she takes off she's having an affair with Sam Loomis played by John Gavin and the idea is that they're gonna he's in debt isn't he? he's got debts and she's gonna help him pay them off so they can live be together um, she stops um, she don't want to stay somewhere she stops the side of the road doesn't she and the police like tell her to move on basically yeah. but he's very suspicious yeah. though, isn't he but he doesn't want to she doesn't want to stay anywhere where there's lots of people so she yeah. goes to this little motel called Bates Motel where she meets the um, owner's son 
Norman, played by Anthony Perkins, brilliant performance by. Yep. Um, and he just is creepy. Yeah. Um, and he basically murders her, and which is strange because it's halfway through. I think it's only about what half an hour, forty minutes into yeah, the film, that, the, yeah. the main character is murdered, and then the the rest of it. Um, Marion's sister. Vera uh, Miles, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, played by Vera Miles. She hires a uh, private detective, played by Martin Balsam, and they basically track her, along with Sam Loomis, they track Marion down to this motel. Obviously, Norman claims not to know anything about it. Um, he claims to live alone with his mother. Um, and they, turns out in the end, which is a spoiler, is mm. his mother's actually dead. Mm. And he is dressing up as his mother to kill people. Um, There's a famous scene right at the end with Martin Balsam going in and the the light light bulb and the stairs and Vera Miles' character when she discovers the body of uh, Mrs. Bates. So again, I think that is... um, I mean, it it basically... It's considered like the sort of the first slasher movie ever made, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. It's a total new genre of movie we've never seen. Um, Again... Uh, music by Bernard Herrmann mm. which really does say I mean so iconic isn't it if you hear the psycho music you know it's you know it's it's just so ingrained in our psyche I think yeah. now and again I think he had to put up a lot of the money himself because studios didn't really want to touch it um, I believe they built the psycho house that's still on there the back on yeah. the back lot universal which I think you can I don't know if it's part of the tour anymore but you could I think at one point visit it yeah but yeah, so Psycho, I think we have we saw it recently in the cinema yeah. and I think it does add add to the whole... Um, sort of tension, tension and suspense. Of, yeah, yeah, suspension of the film. Um, I believe that was the actual theatrical release as mm. well that we saw. Yeah, had a couple of extra scenes yeah. or whatever, yeah. So yeah, it's probably, I think, his best, best oh, work. Oh yeah, 100%. And if you haven't watched it, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> Go watch it. Okay, so we done that on that one? Yep. Okay, no, no, no. so we're going to move on to our next one, and that is Clint Eastwood. Yep. So, where do we start? Let's just have a look <laughs> at his... his um, he, I mean, a prolific director again. His first f- film as director, Play Misty for Me, um, High Plains Drifter, Iga Sanction, Outlaw Josie Wells, Gauntlet, Bronco Billy, Firefox, Honky Tonk Man, Sudden Impact, Tightrope, Pale Rider, Heartbreak Ridge, Bird, White Hunter, Blackheart, The Rookie, Unforgiven, The Perfect World, Bridges of Madison County, Absolute Power, Be Night in the Garden of Good and Evil, True Crime, Space Cowboys, Bloodwork, Mystic River, Million Dollar Baby, Flags of Our Fathers, Fla- Fla- Letters from Iwo Jima, Changeling, Gran Torino, Invictus, Hereafter, J. Edgar, Jersey Boys, American Sniper, Sully, Miracle on the Hudson, the fifteen seventeen to Paris, the Mule, Richard Jewell, and Cry Macho, um, and I, I don't know if he's still going. I don't know if he's. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm going to go first. Yeah. Now, it's I think there's only a handful of films he's actually made where he's not been starred in them as well. Right. Yeah. But I'm going to I mean, I, again just going through that list. It's like each time <laughs> I, I go through the list, list I. Um, I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to go with the um, first one, Million Dollar Baby, which... Um, well, I've not seen, so... No. I'll let you take the no, reins. Oh, okay. So it basically stars... He's kind of a... Um, sort of a washed-up um, boxing trainer, runs a gym. Um, his... Uh, one of his boxers who is... Um, got a title shot, leaves him. And... Essentially, you've got um, Hilary Swank, who plays Maggie Fitzgerald. She's a female boxer. Um, she trains at the gym, and she wants him to train her. And initially, obviously, he sort of is reluctant and refuses. But then he um, he, he comes round and basically trains her to um, to the title, I think. And spoiler alert, in the end, um, she actually ends up... Uh, being paralysed. Did she? Did she trip? Did she? And no, she gets she gets hit by the opposite, but her, she kind of sucker punches her. Yeah, I think she hits her after the bell. Something or, to do with a stool, yeah, is it as well? And she falls and she hits her head on the stool, so yeah. she's paralysed. Um, and then she uh, asks him for one last favour, 
and that is basically to let her die, mm. which he does. Um, really sad film. So it's kind of an inspiring film, but a sad film as well. Yeah. But well, uh, the, the only real things I know about the film is Hilary Swank won an Oscar, didn't she? Yeah. Morgan Freeman yeah. did, yeah. and it won Clint Eastwood his second Best Director Oscar. Yeah, that's I, right. I don't know if it won the Best Picture that year, but so you know you've got a couple of Oscars there. It must be a good movie, isn't it? You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I thought it was a great film. Um, I mean, the trouble with films like that is you can overdo kind of sort of the um, kind of too too schmaltzy about it. But it wasn't. I think just the way that it was filmed. Mm. I mean, he he plays his sort of normal taciturn kind of grumpy, yeah. you know, old man that he does. Mm. But yeah, I mean, it's it's just like you say, brilliant performances, particularly from Hilary Swank and uh, and Morgan Freeman. I think well deserving. Maybe not not one that a lot of people would pick possibly they might pick some of his earlier his earlier work um his cowboy f- not uh, cowboy <laughs> films but yeah mm-hmm. um my first oh, one that's a very good pick um yeah. now my first is another one that doesn't feature him uh, uh because I know you've got one that doesn't feature don't you yeah that's right yeah um yeah. Mystic River yeah have you got that on there? No, I haven't. No, I was um, I was kind of yeah toying with that one. Yeah. Well, I didn't actually realise it was a Clint Eastwood film until I watched it, yeah. and um, it's, it, it's when I think of Clint Eastwood, it, it's not a very Clint Eastwood movie no. to me. Um, so basically, it's about this small town called Mystic River, and you've got these three friends: Kevin Bacon, who's the police detective; Tim Robbins, who's a friend; and it's uh, the main character, Sean Penn. It's like a Mystic River is like a little tiny town where everyone knows each other, and Sean Penn's daughter gets murdered, and there's a, the, the whole town's up in arms, and it's basically the whole investigation about who murdered her. But the biggest story is how these three childhood friends who went through trauma back in the day sort of brought them all back together, didn't it? And it's just yeah. a story about friendship, and it's hopeful. Yeah. Um, I just like, like I said, it, it's the overarching, overarching. Uh, Overarching, 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 yeah. English is my first yeah. language. <laughs> uh, story of just hope I get from it, and I mean Sean Penn's brilliant in it. Tim Robbins is brilliant. Yeah. In it. Both won Oscars for yeah. it as well. Um, and yeah, it's just I, I, it's one of those movies where you watch it and it stays with you. You know, it sticks with yeah. you, and it, it's like at times it's gut wrenching. Um, it's, it's, it's bit. I mean, it's a bitterly sad film as well. I mean, there's a, there's a scene obviously yeah. when he finds out he's his daughter's dead that he yeah. just basically breaks down yeah. and um, but like I said there's that overarching um, like sense of hope about it but then yeah. you get I don't know if I want to spoil it oh, I can't spoil it you just go you know what I'm going to yeah. you know what's in I'm going to say yeah. um, but yeah it, it's one the way it kind of it like tampers with all your all your feelings you know one minute you're really hopeful next you're, you're rock bottom you're depressed basically um, but yeah, what I take from it is is sort of hope. But there's a bit of a sting at the back of your throat, you know, when you think about it. But it's just a brilliant film, and it's just great to see these these three main characters come together once again. And yeah, there's not more what I can really say. It's a it's a brilliant Clint Eastwood like sort of detective sort of thriller film. Um, but yeah, it's a brilliant film. Yeah, not more that you can say no, about you it. Can't, no, yeah. Without giving it away, <laughs> so. Right, so my next one, which is probably on your list, is yeah. Unforgiven. Yep. Which um, I think is possibly one of the best westerns yep. ever made. Um, so it's Clint Eastwood again, an older Clint Eastwood. Um, he plays uh, William Money, who's uh, an ex kind of outlaw gunfighter. He's uh, living on a farm with his two kids. His wife has died. He's approached by. Uh, kid called Schofield Kid to um, hunt. Uh, basically, what happened is, is Big Whiskey is the town where little Bill Daggett, played by um, Gene Hackman, he's the sheriff. Um, these two guys come into town and, and they cut up uh, one of the prostitutes. Uh, and the, basically, a co workers are, are appalled by uh, the, the lack of sort of um, justice given by the sheriff so they put together a bounty and to hire gun gun fighters to come in and and mm. find these guys so him uh Schofield kid and will bill money they uh 
along with uh, I think it's one of one of Bill Money's old partners, Ned Logan, played by Morgan Freeman. They travel to Big Whiskey to uh, to to get the bounty. Um, again, it's it's quite a brutal film, but I think it's very it's, it's an honest film. I think mm. um, there's I think it is probably one of the most accurate depictions of the West at that time, yeah, possibly. Sure. Because you you know you get you go from sort of the fifties like with the Lone Ranger type thing to um, to this film, which is just I think again is well the one really... the one the big praise I can give it is uh, westerns. Of course, I respected them because they were a huge part of film history, but they were never really a genre. Not that I didn't care about, but I could never get into. After watching Unforgiven, that completely switched it for me. Um, in my it, it sort of after maybe the sixties westerns just died down. There's there's no such thing as westerns anymore, you know. And this film comes out in the nineteen ninety two, I believe, and it's it, it's like a it's like those sixties westerns, but much more modern, darker take yeah. on it. And it like you said, it's much more um, of how the the west actually was, yeah. you know. Um, I mean, Clint Eastwood carries this film, well, doesn't he? There's lots of themes as well. It's about, um, it's obviously the West is, you know, it's about the death of the West. It's about mm. um, a man trying to escape his past, but finds that he it keeps catching up with him and he can't really fully escape it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just it's just a brilliant film, I think, completely. Yeah, I believe um, Gene Hackman won the, the yeah. Oscar for that. Uh, yeah. Clint Eastwood got Best Director yeah. and then it won Best, best Picture as well. as well. Yeah. So you know, you you never think a western would have been no. win best picture. And again, it it it, um, it it really just re restarted the whole um, western. Yeah, I mean the amount of westerns that came in the nineties, and now if, really, if it wasn't for that film, because we still get westerns nowadays, yeah. don't we? Yeah. Which as once again that much more modern, darker take on it, and this was the the start of it all, really, wasn't yeah. it? You know, um, I mean. To say a film completely rejuvenated a, a dying genre, it's it's mm. got to be good, isn't it? You know, yeah. so yeah. If you haven't watched, like I said, if you're like me, I know westerns are some that you think is is yesteryear, yeah, in film, and maybe younger younger audiences like myself maybe didn't grow up with them, but just give this a go. And and once again, it's a it's a film that sticks with you, and you're like, wow, that is just great filmmaking, yeah. isn't it? You know, yeah. so yeah, brilliant film. So that was on our both our list, yeah, it? both okay. our list, yeah. <laughs> right. So again, I just didn't, I didn't really know what to, what to go with for this one. I was kind of torn between um, Gran Torino, yeah, but I think I want to go with American Sniper, yeah. Um, don't know if that's on your list. No, it's not. No, uh, American Sniper tells the story, or as it suggests, of <laughs> a sniper. It was American, really. It was American, yeah, yeah. Uh, played by. Um, uh, Bradley Cooper yeah. plays Chris Kyle. It's based on a true story. Um, it, it was it was quite old. Well, he was in his thirties when he joined the, the Seals, and so he, he pushed through a lot of. Um, obviously, he he overcame a lot to to become a Seal, and then he he went to um, Iraq, where again as a sniper he became um, their top sniper. And that's basically about his story, mm. based on his life story. Um, it's about his struggle to to, to adjust because I think he did like four term as far tours in Iraq, I think. And it's about how he struggles to to adjust back to civilian life when he's at home because he's got a wife and children, um, and how he he can never, I guess, like a lot of soldiers who went to war, how they can never explain what they've seen and what they've been through and what they went through when they when they were there. Um, so he, he does explore a bit of the psychological um, aspects of that, but I just think it's a really good film. I know it's a little bit flag waving, in, you know, in some places and that, um, but the fact it's based on a true story yeah. kind of does ground it a little bit. Right, don't shoot me with a sniper. No. I've not seen it. So. No, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sad in because because at the end of the film, he he actually um, does it show what happened to him because obviously he yeah he. he 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 basically he's he goes he goes in, uh, he's asked to visit veterans in hospital because he's kind of a bit of a legend in the uh, the yeah. whole sort of forces and so he goes and he he sort of visits um, injured veterans in the hospital tries to help them and he finds that actually helps him as well 
Um, and then what he does is he, he starts taking sort of ex servicemen who are struggling, take them, teach them to shoot, takes them to the the shooting range. Um, and in the end, unfortunately, some one of his um, people who's trying to help actually killed him. Um, so that's a spoiler again. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's Clint Eastwood films and just yeah. depression. Isn't well, it, it is a little bit, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just a well for for a war film. I think you know it doesn't. It doesn't sort of celebrate war. It does show you the horrors of it, yeah. and, and that these the people there are individuals, and they do have, you know, they do are, are um, affected by it psychologically. Mm. But um, yeah, I just think it's a it's a it's a brilliant film. Oh, um, I definitely have to watch it because yeah. it's definitely a, a seeping hole, yeah. <laughs> gaping hole in, in yeah. my filmography. So. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, and you've already mentioned this film. Okay. It's Gran Torino. Okay. Um, I, I don't know why I've I it came out in two thousand eight, and I have like really, really fond memories of watching this when I was like nine or something. Mm. Um, I think it was probably the first of a Clint Eastwood film I watched, and um, well, one the film's named after his car, yeah. Gran Torino, but um, yeah. Clint Eastwood plays a, a veteran of the Korean War, and um. He's sort of got these. Um, I suppose he's, he's kind of racist towards Koreans, isn't he? Mm, you know, because yeah. he still thinks thinks back like he's in the Korean War and stuff. He doesn't really like. He's that stereotypical old cynical man. Um, and a Korean family moves in uh, next to him, and at first he, he sort of has like this this hatred towards him, you know. And uh, when they start getting um, sort of entangled in in gang warfare. He, uh, they op- they sort of he helps them, and they sort of like welcome him with open arms, even though he even says like some pretty um, slurvy stuff towards yeah. them. They still yeah. o- they still accept him yeah. as one of their own, basically. And across the film, you see him turn from this sort of cynical old man yeah. who has views of yesterday year to to sort of um, seeing them in a different light, yeah. you know. And I'd like to say I'm not going to say what happens at the end, <laughs> but he has a very he's, he's, he's worried about the young young boy Tao yeah getting involved in gangs yeah and and so he, he kind of takes him under his wing helps him get a job, um, but like you say in the end and he he actually says it in the film doesn't he that he he finds that he's got more in common with the yeah. the Hmong people than he does with his own family yeah because they're all they're after is is his money when he's when he's gone. And and so yeah, it's it's, um, it's an interesting film. I think definitely deals with racism. Yeah, deals with changing America. I think um, and changing attitudes. Yep, hundred um, percent. That you know sometimes we're a little bit um, scared of people. Yeah, um, kind of. But then once you get to know know them, and and then you realise they're not so different to. Yeah. To, to us and that's really like that's really the overarching yeah. plot of the story isn't yeah. it and like I said the the thing that stands out is, is Clint Eastwood's actual um, story arc in this you actually see him uh, transform completely yeah. almost you know and like I said I'm not going to give the the ending away but once again it is a quite a depressing film but um, uh, at the end of it the actions that he takes uh, it can leave you smiling at the end isn't yeah, it so it it's a very good film and once again I mean for Clint Eastwood to still be acting starring in a full movie you know <laughs> yeah. at the age age he is is just amazing yeah. and hats off to him and, and the fact that, he, that he's he's still directing doing films now you know hats off to him okay good yeah. so moving on the next one is Richard Donner yep um, not a particularly prolific director but you just no. look at some of his I mean the Omen, for for example, Superman, Superman Two, which he was uncredited for, Inside Moves, Superman Two, The Richard Donner Court, Lady Hawk, The Goonies, Lethal Weapon, Screws, Lethal Weapon Two, Radio Fly, Lethal Weapon Three, Maverick, Assassins, Conspiracy Theory, Lethal Weapon Four, Timeline, Sixteen Blocks. So I think we would chose him because he's a it, we're a big fan yeah, of him, aren't we? You know, yeah. this is more personal to us. Yeah. I mean, he's a great director, but um. Yeah, if you want to say your first. Uh, okay, well, it's going to be Superman, isn't it? Yep. Because um, when you think of Richard Donner, you think of Superman, <laughs> yeah. don't you? Um, I mean, you look at 
the old man, for, uh, he, he got obviously got the. He was asked to direct Superman from off the back of the Omen. Um, we are going to be doing a Superman special, so yeah. I don't really want to go into no. great detail about it, but he basically had a month pre-production to uh, before they started shooting. They had all sorts of problems. You know, He was constantly told he was going over budget. Um, the actual production like, ran, I think, over a year, longer than it should have done. So he had all sorts of problems to have to face and to actually produce a film that I think really kind of defined the soup it's a definition of the superhero movie at mm. that time um and without superman we wouldn't have had any superhero movie i don't no. think after that because i mean you look at the superhero movies at the time there were nothing in comparison. I, mean, I, I think the, the previous superman movie to that was superman and the mole man yeah which was, you know, was a lot of creature, fe- yeah. creature feature um but so yeah so i think that just um superman just as a film Alone was is is a great film. Yeah. Then as a superhero film, is is I think yeah, is was the blueprint for ones to come after that. Hundred percent. And like I said, I don't want to go too much into it because like I said, we've got a Superman um, special coming up. But the main thing I take away from uh, Superman is is he just got the character Superman so right. Yeah. Like he cared. He was a fan of the comics growing yeah. up, and he just understood the character of Superman. And he respected the character, respected the source material, put his own twist on things that um, you know helped the movie. And yeah, it, like you said, if it wasn't for this yeah. this movie, we wouldn't have any MCU or, or whatever. So exactly, yeah. Like, so we will go into more detail on our, <laughs> on our Superman special. Okay, yours. <laughs> Once it's the Donica of yeah, Superman too. Okay. So right. like I said, right. I don't want to go too much, but just a little background. Yeah. Um, they were filming Superman one and two simultaneously. Things got a bit too much on the budget side, so they decided to shelve uh, Superman 2, finish Superman. Uh, we'll go into more detail about why, but um, Donna left, brought in Richard Lester, and he had to film. Uh, they already had it. He already, Donna already filmed, what, about 75%, 75% of, yeah. of Superman 2. Richard Lester had to come in, and to get a film credit, it's actually 60% yeah, you have to have. To do, yeah. So he had to reshoot basically Donna's movie, uh, from scratch, and um, do you know what? I, I like Super. Like I said, we're getting to it more in the next podcast. Uh, I like I like Superman too. I like Richard Lester Superman mm-hmm. too. But once again, um, from what limited sources he had, because he had to sort of use test footage as well, mm-hmm. and it's got like this Frankenstein's monster of a sequel. Um, once again, the the thing that's that's different to to Superman two, Richard Lester's one, is the fact that just once again, Richard Donner got the character of Superman. He understood him. Yeah. Once again, you respect the character, respect the law, and in my opinion, it's a superior film. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> totally agree. And like I say, we're going to cover that more in our yeah. um, our Superman special podcasts coming up probably yep. next week. Aimless plug there, mate. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So, so Superman was on your list. Yeah. Superman two. Right. Yep. And I, I think I know which one's going to be on your list. <laughs> well, it's one of my favorite movies. This, of all time. This was a tussle between Lethal Weapon, yeah. but I've gone for Scrooged. Okay, yeah. Which um, that must have been hard to try and pick well, them because you, you love both movies. Yeah. Um, Scrooge is basically an update of the uh, Christmas Carol story, and it stars Bill Murray um, is the kind of titular character, um, Frank Cross, I believe, uh, who's a st- uh, TV executive, um, and so it's again it just follows the same same story as Christmas Carol you've still got the ghost of Christmas past present and future but it's just again set around um, TV, a TV executive trying to um, trying to get a live version actually of a Christmas Carol yeah. um, starring Buddy Hackett as Scrooge <laughs> oh, <I'm okay. laughs> yeah uh, and it's just yeah it's just um, I love I mean I love I love the whole Christmas Carol mm. um, story. Anyway, um, I love. I mean, I've seen so many different versions of Scrooge, but this is an interesting update of it, um, and I just think it's a fantastic film. Um, if you're going to watch it, you should. I'm sorry, mm. you should watch. Really watch this yeah. film. Yeah, I think Murray again is. He carries a film, absolutely Daddy. brilliant. He's yeah. just he's Bill Murray, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. So. So yeah. it's just interesting to see that updated version, yeah. modern take on Scrooge, you know, because even though it's following the same story, basically, it's it's in a totally different um, sort of world, isn't it? And it's it's just, 
yeah and it's got that little Richard Donner yeah. twist on it so or take on it so yeah <laughs> that must have been hard though to, between Mate, it was two. yeah uh, apparently right this is a little bit of trivia filming yeah. began in December 87 mm. and Richard Donner said asked if the production could have the Christmas day off but Paramount Pictures refused yeah so they should continue Christmas day so he outwitted them so Christmas Eve he fired the whole crew <laughs> <laughs> then December the 26th he rehired them that's so Richard Donner anyway. <laughs> that's, that's the most yeah. Richard Donner thing to do it is so um, yeah apparently he was a bit of a character yeah um, I don't think him and Bill Murray got on very well but yeah he just nice good pick yeah there's a, there's a few stories that I think we'll go into oh yeah um, in, the, in the Superman episode well sometimes but, like, two big characters Bill Murray and yeah. Richard Donner just sometimes yeah. they butt heads a bit but yeah good choice um, and I think I know what your last one is. This isn't a shock to anyone, it's Goonies. Yeah. Because of course it is. <laughs> um, and now I've, I don't remember the first time you let me watch Goonies, but I grew up watching this film, didn't I? Um, mm, yeah. Uh, it was one of the earliest records. That's not weird. T2 is my son, so that's not weird at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. just to put that out okay. there. Um, but yeah, no, this is one of the first films I really remember watching, and I used to watch it repeatedly. And I, it's got that sort of Richard Donner sort of sense of, of wonder to it. Um, it's got a huge cast, doesn't it? It's got like Josh Brolin, Sean Astin, um, Corey Feldman, uh, Keehan Coy, Key, yeah. Key Can Coy or something. Yeah. Short round from Indiana yeah. Jones. Um, and like I said, I don't want to give too much away, but it's, it's a coming of age story. It's very 80s. Um, Spielberg was heavily involved this with this. It, it's a very it's Amblin, I believe, mm, isn't it? Yeah. He produced it, and uh, they. I don't. Know, I don't want to go into too much detail, but they find a treasure map, and this treasure map takes them on, on an absolute awesome adventure. Um, Cause aren't, aren't they about to get their house repossessed? Get, or yeah. So uh, there's this huge, there's this company that wants to buy their house, and basically this this. Adventure is their last sort of adventure as friends because they're all going to move away, and yeah, it's just just a, like a sense of adventure that kids eat up, and I certainly did. And I think the last time I watched this film was about six months ago, and I still love it as much as I did when I was a kid because it's just it's entertaining, it's fun, it doesn't take itself too seriously, and it's got that Richard Donner like playfulness, sort of sense of of wonder and. Yeah, it's just it's one of the most entertaining films of all time. Um, once again, it's very it's got the sort of magic that Amblin films have. It's very Spielberg as well, and yeah, it's just a really good film. Um, it's one of those films you can just put on and just have a have a good time with it, you know. And it's got um sloth in, and everyone loves sloth, don't we? So yeah, but yeah, just Who yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're somehow oh. what like listen to this and you're six years old watch this film with Kevin already <laughs> so yeah just it's a great film okay so moving on uh, we've got well one two three four five another six to do so yep. okay bear with us stay tuned <laughs> yep <laughs> uh, Stanley Kubrick yep again not not a prolific director but mm. some of the films he's made have been very influential and, and obviously oh, iconic yeah. and live on long past um, him can I just try and guess one of your movies? Go on then. Pass the Glory. Yes. Okay. Well, because I'm looking at it now on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> that was on my list as well, oh, okay. so I'd go into it. Um, maybe not a well-known of uh, Kubrick's films, but one of his first ones um, stars Kurt Douglas set in World War One, and it, it's basically about um, an attack that fails. Uh, French, set, uh, sorry, sorry to say. It's French Army. Yep. Um, again, it's, it's not what you call... Really, normal subject matter for for a film, possibly. Especially when you think of it as a war film as well. It's yeah. got some other. Essentially, it's it's, it's about um, soldiers are ordered to attack what they call the ant hill. Um, the attack fails. It's an impossible situation. The general in charge uh, feels that the men were cowards and they they abandoned the attack, and so they're basically asked to pick three men out essentially for court martial for cowardice just to make an example of them and Kurt Douglas plays Colonel Dax and he defends the men at the court martial um, and spoiler alert in the end basically they've made up their mind already before 
they're even it's it's basically a kangaroo cart. It's just just for show, and the men are executed. Um, so again, it's really quite a powerful film. Um, really good performance from Kurt Douglas in a tr- dramatic role. Yeah. Um, a non Spartacus role. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just think as a film, it's, it's brilliantly shot, it's uh, brilliantly acted, just complete. Again, it's one of those maybe unknown films that yeah. a lot of people, you know, have never really heard of. But yeah, I think. Oh, yeah, 100%. And um, some things I'll take away from it. One, the sort of the sort of um, when he's defending the men there's bits of drama and tension but then the way he, I always like Kubrick because he shoots action very well and there's there's some action scenes in there where they still hold up today don't they they're still yeah. um, absolutely brilliant and like I said the way he shoots the action sort of these long panning um, yeah. shots and um it's basically everything you want in a in a sort of mm. war movie, isn't it? Yeah. And it's, it's always not. It's refreshing to see a movie actually about World War One for once, isn't it? Yeah, I've done World War Two, you know. Um, like you said, it's not one of Kubrick's most well-known films, mm. but um, like I said, I think it was fifty-seven, was it, or something like that? Yeah. It was one of his early works. It was pre um, pre Spartacus. Yeah, so, pre Spartacus. Yeah. Um, but yeah, all in all, it, it sort of laid the groundwork of Kubrick, and it's it's um, you can sort of see where his sort of took off his filmography didn't yeah. it um, but yeah really good film um, and I'm glad you had it on your yeah. list as well I'm glad it gets the recognition <laughs> yeah I just think it's one of like I say one of his unknown films I think yeah. it deserves probably the the the, um, the accolades that it does um, so what's what's that, so that was on your list as well yeah okay so I want to go for the next one which is probably going to be a strange one um it's called The Killing. Again, it's an early one, 1956, kind of unknown. I don't know if I've heard this before. Um, and it's basically, it's essentially about um, uh, a robbery. Yeah. Star Sterling Hayden as Johnny Clay. He's, um, he's been released after five years in prison. He assembles a five-man team to carry out what he estimates will be a $2 million heist at Lansdowne Racetrack. Um and it's just about the the planning and execution of the, of the. It's an early kind of heist film. It's it's kind of a bit like. What, um, what, um, you said it was one of yeah, his early work, wasn't 56, it? Fifty six. So it's before Path to Glory as well. Um, but I think uh, it's kind of an early kind of like an Ocean's Eleven style film because you see the sort of planning, the execution of the of the actual whole robbery. And interestingly enough, it's influenced a lot of films after that, including The Dark Knight. Oh wow! Because if you remember the start of the Dark Knight, yeah. the, the robbery, the masks that the guys wear, very similar to the ones no that they way. wear in the That's crazy. actual. Yeah, so it just shows how influential Kubrick's work's been on mm. other other directors as well. Yeah, so great, nice. I think again, it's it's one of those films that's um, needs to be watched to be appreciated. I think. Yeah, so, like I said, it's one I've never heard of. Yeah. So, so I'll give watch that watch. <laughs> Will do. Um, Right, now my next one is probably his most famous work. Everyone probably knows what I'm going to say. It's 2001, Space Odyssey. Um, Not on my list, amazingly, no. no. no I'll, uh, I'll get into that in a bit, but I've got just a quick plot summary. I was discovering a monolith on the lunar surface. The Discovery 1 and its revolutionary supercomputer set out to unravel its mysterious origin. And so the film starts out, which is the best bit in the whole movie. Um, it's thousands of years back. Uh, and you've got a load of um, apes, don't you? Yeah. Which is the best part of the movie. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they they uh, discover this this sort of monolith. Um, and uh, like I said, that's that's the best part of the whole movie. Um, and it sort of shows progression. Um, so there's these two um, sets of chimps, and they've got beef with each other. And one of them discovers a bone. And it picks it up and it looks at it in a very ape way and it discovers it can be used as a weapon. And they use the weapon on the other set of chi- uh, apes or chimps, whatever it is. Chimps, yeah, I think. Chimps. Yeah. And it just shows that sort of progression, natural progression. And it's, it's got one of the best um, sort of transitions because at the end, of the, the uh, I think the scene's only, what, like 10 yeah. minutes? The chimp smashes the ground with the bone, knocks another bone up. And it transitions into um, some sort of spacecraft. Yeah. Ah, 
Yeah. So I thought you wanted to say that. Uh, It stars Keir DeLay and uh, Gary Lockwood. Um, But really, the, the... like I said, they go they go after the monolith for uh, its mysterious origins and whatnot. But the the main takeaway from two thousand one is the actual effects itself. Mm. Like when when I first watched this, I couldn't believe it was made in nineteen sixty eight. It was absolutely revolutionary, and like you could you could those type of effects of like the spacecraft because uh, it's a lot about. The, uh, I've seen some people say, "Oh, it's it's too long or whatnot, or it's sort of boring." Because there's a lot of scenes where like classical music is playing and it's just the spacecraft like um, floating through air or, or space, but then again, you got to think this is 1968, and people have never seen effects like this before. They've never seen how far a movie can stretch, and he just wanted to show off basically what what he could do. Yeah. You know, um, obviously the the main the main character, the best character is Hal 9000, <laughs> which is a supercomputer. Yeah. And he's he's the sort of um, I say I say villain, isn't he? Hello, Dave. Yeah. That's like, it's very menacing because you've got all it, all you've got is a red light to show that he's mm. kind of watching in a way, and he can control yeah. certain parts of the ship and, and whatnot. Yeah, it's really. But it, um, basically, Hal tries to stop them from discovering the mysterious monolith where its origins are from. And then I, I tell you, it's, it's, I could have sworn I took like a magic mushroom or something from watching this <laughs> film. Like I said, yeah. I can't put into words what the yeah. what I'm describing right now, but it uh, it it goes through loads of different themes. Yeah. I mean, um, cinematography by the sort of the great Jeffrey Unsworth. Yep, um, who did Superman yeah. as well. Yeah, definitely. So that that adds to it as well. So it's all right. Um, it's all right. I, yeah, you can chip in if you want. It's it's just really hard to explain mm. what the film is because it's so. It takes in different directions you never thought. Because when I first saw it, I just thought it was going to be about their only about their um, sort of mission to discover the origins of this monolith. But then it brings in different themes um, about it's not always the right thing to try and discover something's origins or whatnot, and some stuff should be left in the past and yeah. whatnot. But yeah, just uh, it's got the, a brilliant um, soundtrack to it as well. The the main theme is once again like Psycho. Is very iconic. Um, I believe it was it was the he sampled the piece, didn't he? It wasn't made for the movie specifically, yeah. but like I said, once again, just watch this film because um, it's got a, all I can say. It's got a huge baby in it. Yeah. Um, if that doesn't make you want to watch the film, <laughs> I don't know what. But yeah. like I said, I just really can't put into words to describe this movie. You just got to yeah. watch it yourself because, like I said, it, it is probably Kubrick's best work. And I mean. Kubrick was known for his his epic planning, yeah. Um, and he actually got um, NASA Apollo administrator George Mueller and astronaut Deke Slayton um, to actually uh, help with the technical and scientific accuracy mm. of it. Um, special effects team included Douglas Trumbull. I went on to actually work on Star Wars and like Jurassic Park. It's and, very Star Wars yeah. as well. Um Yeah. So you know, so he they were obviously pioneering special effects there yeah. before Star Wars did it. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like well. I said, you look so, at the you look at these effects and they still stand up better than shitty CGI nowadays. Yeah. yeah. But the only the only thing if I can leave you with this is if you think that this film is going in a particular direction, throw it out because it takes you in a totally different direction because yeah. it's just explores all these underlying themes and about evolution as well. You know, it's, it's, it's overarching themes about that. And yeah, it's just like you're taking magic mushrooms because it's, it's just <laughs> so crazy. Wait, have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah. I have, yeah. And you, you get one shot. I'm yeah, finding no, it hard is, yeah. to describe it the is, ending because it's yeah, so it weird. Quite trippy, yeah. But, yeah, it's just a. It, it shows the best of Kubrick, mm. and at the time they overstretched, or, or I suppose they sort of pioneered the the special effects at the time. Yeah. You know, this was a huge, huge deal on special effects, and and like you said, uh, workers have gone on to work on like Star Wars mm. and stuff, and you can see that. But yeah, just watch this movie because it's a it's a it's a brilliant film. Yeah, it's a bit slow, but you know, just get mm. through it, and you'll get to the big baby at the end. So. <laughs> Okay, so my last film, which maybe I don't know, it's hard because you know you've got Doctor Strange, you've got Clockwork Orange, you've got 
shining, but I've gone for more full metal jacket. Yeah, me too. Yep. Because I'm obviously I'm quite I love war films. Um and this is quite unusual for, well, I don't is it unusual for a war film. It's kind of in two parts really. The first part is essentially the, the a group of Marines, raw recruits training at Paris Island for the Vietnam War and the second half of it is basically follows them well mainly one of the um recruits called uh, Private Joker played by Matthew Modine that's his nickname because yeah. when they um when they first join they're all given nicknames by the uh drill instructor uh, Sergeant Hartman gunnery Sergeant Hartman played by the legend Ron Ali Army mate Ali Army, legend yeah who was uh, I believe a sergeant during the Vietnam War um so he came in really I think his part was actually quite small, I think, initially. Yeah. And then I think Kubrick expanded it when he saw him. Because a lot of his lines, I think, were ad-libbed, and he took them from his actual time in the, the right. service. But it's it's a great film, I think. It's a brilliant film. The fact it's all shot in Britain as well, which is quite amazing. How Even the Vietnam scenes? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> I didn't realise we had, like, luscious yeah, trees and I don't forests. Know, yeah. So... Well, I believe so. Yeah, I think well, he, it, he lived it? here, didn't he, for the last yeah. what sixty years of his life? So, um, yeah, like I say, Kubrick, he was rig- originally the right dialogue for Ermy's character, but he became so impressed with what Ermy improvised, he decided to keep it in. And there are some quite funny scenes in that yeah. as well. Um, again, there's a, there's um, Vincent D- D'Onofrio plays uh, Private Pyle, kind of a bit of a screw up, a washout. Um, he ends up. Shall I spoil it? No, I don't know. Do you want to spoil no, it? No, I spoil it. You've got to watch it then. Yeah. I've, I've teased it enough, so you've got to, <laughs> um, yeah, you've got to watch it. But again, it's, I think it just, um, it captures, well, for what I what I can imagine uh, training to be like as well, quite brutal, because mm. um, you're kind of breaking people down to build them up and then back in into com- what it might be like in combat. Um, Private Joker's a... Uh, He's actually a reporter, journalist, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, for Stars and Stripes, and he so it kind of follows him around. So he, you get to see a little bit of combat, and some of the um, some of the the, the recruits that he, he actually trained with as well. I mean, it was cowboy, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. But yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it's a brilliant film, I think, mm. as well. And and that's why I chose it over. I know you like Strange Love, like, don't you? Yeah, like the the Shining or or Strange Love. Yeah, I, I this is probably my favourite Kubrick film, and um, on the poster it says "War is Hell," and Kubrick shows that war is hell, you know, and we see the the Vietnam War through Private Joker's eyes, um, someone whose job doesn't really require combat that often, and he just sees the horrors of the Vietnam War, and Kubrick shows the hot, the real what it was like to be on the, the battlefields in Vietnam, and. Um, it's sort of a different, like, sort of take on it because it's from a uh, reporter's, third reporter's eyes. But yeah, it, it truly does show the horrors of Vietnam, and it's like you're you're there with him, you know. Um, it's got a great, great. I, I won't spoil it, but it's got a great third act, and it's got it's, it starts to bring those themes up. Like, is war a good thing? You know, no one benefits from war and whatnot. You know, and yeah, it's just brilliant. Vietnam War film and one one of the best Vietnam War films of all time. Yeah, so I totally agree. Yeah. Done it. You got any more? No, no, no. Okay, so we're going to move on quickly because mm. uh, we've got another five to do. <laughs> <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola again, not a, not a prolific director, but he's he's more prolific as a producer. Mm. But obviously, Godfather, Con- Conversation, Godfather Part Two, Apocalypse Now, One from the Heart, The Outsiders, Rumble Fish, Cotton Club. Peggy Sue Got Married, Gans of Stone, Took on the Man in His Dream, Godfather Part 3, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Jack, The Rainmaker, Supernova, Youth Without Youth, Tetro, Twix, Distant Vision. And that was his last film he made in 2016. And there's been quite a big gaps between films as well. Yeah. So do you want to start on this one? Yeah, but uh, mine's going to be very quick. Okay. Right? Um, so I remember seeing The Outsiders yeah. many years ago. Do not remember it, so I can't put it in oh, okay. into there. Um, and it's going to be very quick because yeah. I want uh, the other two I've got Father Part 1 I've got Father Part 2 okay what else what the fuck am I going to say yeah watch exactly. these films yeah. <laughs> literally and I know they're your favourites so I'll let you 
Yeah, Ted okay, Godfather. Um, it starts off in the forties, and it's basically chronicles the life of a mafia family. Um, Don Corleone, played by Marlon Brando. Michael Corleone, played by uh, Al Pacino. Uh, Michael is coming back from the war. Um, he doesn't want to be involved in the family business, but he gets dragged into it when there's an assassination attempt on his father, um, and then he eventually basically takes over as as the Don. Mm. That's that's a simple story like that. I, I get very quickly, very brief, but yeah, watch it. And then the God of Father Part Two, again, it's split into two. It 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 follows um, uh, Don Corleone when he as he when he comes first comes to America, it's played by Robert De Niro, and then it flashes forward to present day, which I think in his fifties, where Michael is now head of the family, and he's it's chronicling his kind of um, power grab. Uh, consolidation of the family business brilliant I think Godfather Part 2 I think is probably the better film mm. um, I think Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro are the only two actors to actually get <laughs> win a Best Actor Oscar for playing the same character yeah um, and I, I just think yeah it's it's a brilliant film well, it's one of those films like what more can you say yeah. isn't it you know, yeah. they're, they're just, two of the greatest films ever made watch it yeah. and then, again that kind of that kind of stamped um, the the whole mafia. Every sort of mafia film to come after that kind of follows that yeah. kind of almost like blueprint. That's again. how to do mafia films, yeah. right? Isn't it? Um, and I think that is is obviously quite telling. Is again, it's it's been it's often been parodied and copied, and and so yeah, watch it. Like I said, you you can't say much no. more, can you? Really, no. they're like, two masterpieces of movies <laughs> and. I mean, you like part two more. I prefer yeah. part one just because I love no. Marlon Brando, but yeah. the two, well, like, honestly, two of the best I mean, films I've made. Think, so, you know, I, I don't think the studio wanted Brando because at that time he was he was considered difficult to work with. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is pre Superman as well. <laughs> which, yeah. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, a uh, couple have fought for him and, you know, he delivered an Oscar winning performance. Mm. Um, so what more can you say yeah exactly um, watch his movies yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to my next one really is Apocalypse Now I think yeah um, I don't know if it's yours no like I said I, I, I've I've not seen Apocalypse Now oh, okay. I've seen The Outsiders in <laughs> part one and part two yeah. but I've not seen um, don't sim- shoot me by the way alright simple story Apocalypse Now is based on a, a story by Joseph Conrad called Heart of Darkness uh, and it's about a it's set during the Vietnam War it's about a um, special Forces um, Colonel called Colonel Kurtz, played by again by Marlon Brando, um, who's kind of gone rogue, st- assembled his own army, and started started attacking targets without authorization. Um, and then Martin Sheen plays Captain Captain Benjamin Willard, and he's essentially sent to assassinate um, uh, Colonel Kurtz, and that's the sort of story. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's 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 more about the journey of how they get there, um, and it shows kind of the the oh, sometimes the futility of war as well, um, and there's, there's there's some yeah and sort of the oddness and like I say the oddness and futility of war. So I'm I'm not sure. It's not really presented as a pro-war and anti-war. It's kind of I think it's left up to you to to make up your own right, yeah. decision on that. But yeah, it's again it's often. Often cited as one of the you know, sort of best films ever made, I think it is. Mm. Um, there's a few versions of it around. There's a Redux version, which I think um, is a, an extended version, which I would I would watch. I mean, I think it's about three and a half hours long, um, but it's worth it in the end. And again, I think some of the some of the stories around the production of it um, are just as interesting as the actual film itself. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I. Yeah. Not watch the film, but I know everything about the behind yeah. the scenes because it was just yeah. how the hell this film it was made. It was essentially a clusterfuck. Yeah, and they managed. It's like a lot of films. They managed to to produce a, 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 an award winning film because mm. I think it won the Palme d'Or at Cannes, and and even before it, I don't think it even been fully edited properly, and it still won the Palme d'Or. <laughs> yeah, and it's just a fantastic film came out of such sort of confusion and and like I say. Well, just going into a bit of the backstory, I believe. Where, where, what was the country they filmed in? 
Um, they filmed it in the Philippines. And, they were the only, weren't and, they the only military or army well, to use the helicopters still? The Philippines, uh, yeah, and they were in, in the middle of a civil war. Yeah. And so what they'd do is they'd, they'd call in the helicopters and find they'd gone off to fight somewhere. Mm. But that's, yeah. And there's another thing. They basically the cast and crew would just drink all day. Yeah. And the um the old uh white snow yeah. was still legal well, there. Harvey Keitel was cast and he left yeah. the production after a couple of weeks. Uh Martin Sheen had a heart attack mid uh mid filming. Uh, I think there was a the worst storm to ever hit them for like in living memory destroyed some of the sets. Didn't I think two one of the crew the stuntmen died, I think. Yeah, some, helicopter crash someone or something died. Like that. So yeah, so that everything was kind of against them, yeah. but um, but yeah, it, they managed to produce such a, a fantastic Did, film. It was funny. Didn't Martin Sheen basically say every single scene he was in, he was he was drunk basically yeah, the, I whole, think so, yeah. the whole <laughs> film. Much, yeah. <laughs> so how the hell they yeah. made this film and a good film like that? Yeah. So yeah, I bet one hundred percent. This one that's that's like I said, a gaping hole in the film. Yeah. I need to watch it. But yeah. good choice. Okay, you got one more to do? No, no, that's that's all okay. my accomplice. All right, so. Moving quickly on, um, Ron Howard. Yep. Um, again, he's got quite, um, quite a. You say diverse. Philosophy? Yeah, I would say diverse. Uh, obviously, came from an acting background mm. into directing. So, Night Shift, Splash, Cocoon, Gung Ho, Willow, Parenthood, Backdraft, Far and Away, The Paper, Apollo Thirteen, Ransom, Ed TV, Alice Grinch Stole Christmas, Beautiful Mind, The Missing, Cinderella Man, The Da Vinci Code, Frost, Nick's Age of Demons. <laughs> Presidential Reunion, Dilemma, Rush, Made in America, In the Heart of the Sea, Inferno, uh, Solo, Star Wars Story, Pavarotti, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, We Free, We Feed People, Thirteen Lives. So, I feel like I should be one of those guys who go in terms of editions of pie. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, again, yeah, it sort of started off in the more kind of comedy you know yeah. films moving into more of a uh, serious um, and action films um, you going to go first on this yeah one, I'll go think? first um, my first film is uh, a classic Backdraft um, <laughs> yeah. so the, the, it's obviously about firemen but the story is that the two main characters are Kurt Russell and William uh, Baldwin and they play uh, two brothers um, basically their dad also played by Kurt Russell very confusing he uh, dies and they both become uh, firemen one of them is very competent Kurt Russell's character is very competent the other is just a he's like a, a sort of junior isn't he and he's coming well he's kind of he's kind of a screw up and he? Yeah. he goes from job to job to job he, he's he's already tried the fire department once and kind of either washed out or left mm. and then so obviously Kurt Russell gives him a hard time about it because Obviously, being a fireman is a pretty big deal, and you don't want him just to like wash out again. Or and they've had sort of like family beef yeah. as well. There was he didn't want him to. He wants him to be serious about it. Obviously, because because lives matter. Yeah, he, he said he can't just be you know. But then, uh, what happens is he he then gets kicked out of of his troop, and then he joins Robert De Niro, and he's a sort of a well, fired investigator. Yeah, yeah, and uh, he's investigating this. He's like a. Uh, a specialist in this phenomena called a backdraft and um, it's basically the movie isn't it it's yeah. just it's about how they sort of rekindle yeah. their their relationship as as brothers yeah. um, don't really want to spoil it but no yeah, but watch it it's it's full on action isn't it it's, it is. very it's good... not you know it's it, it is an action film mm. it's not it's it's dramatic but yeah it's full on action yeah it's, it's an entertaining movie isn't it you yeah, know it is but yes, yeah, it's, it's a really good film, very good cast, and yeah, just well, I believe I'm Donna Sutherland's in it as well, isn't he? He's a yeah. arsonist, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. Um, but yeah, watch it, very good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was actually on my list. As yeah, well. was it? Okay. Yeah. It's so, on do yours. My next one. I know this is on your list, so I might as well go for it. Apollo 13. Yep. Um, it's essentially based on a uh, true star of Apollo 13. Um, it was going to be the third spaceship to travel to the moon um, and they had I think just as they were leaving Earth they had a, um, an explosion on board and it's essentially then the story of how they kept the crew alive and got them back home safely 
and it's it's quite an amazing story. Yeah, stars Tom Hanks as Jim Lovell, Bill Paxton as Fred Hayes, Kevin Baker, Bacon as Jack Swigert. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's an amazing story of survival, and, and the fact it's based on a, a true story as well. Yeah, it just makes it, it even better. It. Um, it is kind of drama action. Um, again, it it builds tension. Um, yeah, because they're sort of they're sort of in space. <laughs> Uh, you don't know what to do. You don't know what, yeah. how the hell do you get out of this yeah. situation, you know. And basically the ground team, Houston, Ed Harris is the chief yeah. there, isn't he? Because essentially there's no rescue in space. No. So everything they do, the crew have to be able to do themselves. So it's like how do you get, you know, they have a, they have a catastrophic power failure. Mm. Um, the, the spaceship's essentially crippled. They can't land on the moon, so they just have to try and get them, get them back. Get them home. back. Yep. You know, I think um, I'm paraphrasing here. I think, um, yeah, and Harris is Gene Kranz, who's the um, the mission controller. Um, he says, you know, we've never lost an American in space. We're not going to lose one on my watch. Yeah. And that was the the feeling of the time. Um, but it kind of, I think, it was like three or four days that they were in space, and you know, it gripped the whole. This is this was a time when. Obviously, two missions have been to the moon. People were losing interest in it. Yeah, um, it wasn't even. I don't think it was even being televised live. The um, the crew, and suddenly this is this is a global news story that just gripped everybody. I think. So, I say, yeah, brilliant film. Um, it's one of those I can put on and just watch any time. Yeah, as well. yeah so. absolutely brilliant. And also love. Um, we both a fan of James Horner's yeah. soundtrack yeah. as well to that. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely brilliant film. Anything else to add to that? Um, also, I like Gary Sinise yeah. as well because he yeah. was he was meant to be Kevin, but Kevin Bacon's wife. I don't know the astronaut's name. Uh, Jack Swagger. Yeah. yeah, Gary Sinise's character. He was supposed to. He was on the crew, but he's re- replaced at last minute because he. I think he got chicken pox or something. Yeah, something like that. Like, uh, measles or something. Yeah. But, just, yeah, just brilliant film, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you want me to go next? Yes, you can go uh, next. Yeah. My last is uh, Beautiful Mind. Okay. Um, is this on your list? No. It's okay. Not, so, no. so it's about the math. I can't even say it. mathematician John Nash, played by Russell Crowe, and it basically it it just sort of tells his life story. Um, he's a he suffers with very bad. He's a very bad schizophrenic, but he's also a very gifted mathematician, and yeah, just basically tells a story from when he first went to uni, and um. I don't know if I want to spoil. Okay, because it's because it's public knowledge. He ends up winning a Nobel Peace Prize um, for mathematics, and it just goes. Um, you just see his uh, schizophrenia. Uh, is that the right word? Schizophrenia. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just get worse throughout the film, and it sort of um, it's like health deteriorates. Uh, Jennifer Connelly's also in it. He, uh, she plays John Nash's wife, and um, yeah, you just it's probably. On the realist interpretations of schizophrenia, um, of course we wouldn't know, but that's that's uh, like I said, it's, it's probably the realist mm. interpretation of, yeah. of schizophrenia, and um, it's a very hopeful movie because, uh, like I said, at the end he wins the Nobel Peace Prize, but he sets it up in a way where it's like he's he's gone too far. Mm. He, he he's there's no coming back from this. Um, but yeah, it just tells us tells his life story. If you're interested in John Nash, definitely watch this film. Yeah. Um, it's a very depressing film. Um, it's very sad, but like I said, it, it it's a very hopeful film, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. and it, and it, it, John Nash is a absolutely wonderful human being, and it's just uh, amazing what he did, and it fully shows it tells his mm. life story, basically, yeah. doesn't it? Definitely, yeah, yeah, good film, yeah. Okay, so my last one is Cinderella Man. Yeah, um, I knew that'd be. I knew that'd be here somewhere. <laughs> again, again, Stan Russell Crowe. Um, and it, it's based on a true story. Uh, boxer James J. Braddock. Um, it was kind of one of the most sort of biggest upsets, probably in sport in history. Um, it's set during the Depression in uh, America, but lots of people out of work. Um, James Braddock. He's basically broken down, beaten up, out of luck. Um, he can't get a fight. Um, he's working on the docks. You know, he's trying to feed his family, and he's given this one last chance to to fight. Mm. Um, and he basically wins. And 
then he goes on to his next fight, which he wins, and his next fight, <laughs> and he just keeps on winning until uh, he till he ends up um, essentially taking on the heavyweight champion of the world, um, a guy called Max Bayer, who'd actually killed two men in the ring, um, and he's he's known as a Cinderella man because it's kind of a rags to riches story. Yeah, but it's it's much more than that because I think he's he's kind of yeah he's he's down on his luck, but he's he's like the people's champion. It's almost like he's carrying the hopes and dreams of all those struggling. Mm. Um, and again, it's a, it's a great film. It's a little bit sentimental at, at times, but it, I think it's 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 a feel good film as yeah, well. Hundred um, percent. Yeah, and I just I just love this film. Yes, yeah, brilliant film. Yeah, I'm a big fan of sort of sports film, boxing kind of film mm. as well. But yeah, so I think I mean the actual. That's what fight scenes themselves are pretty well choreographed. Uh, you got Paul Giamatti plays his, his friend and trainer, um, but yeah, it's it's again, it's one of those films you can just put on and it just makes you feel good. Yeah. I think. <laughs> just an honourable mention. Yeah, Ransom. That's yeah. Good, I know, oh yeah. Give great. me back my son. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, Ransom's yeah, brilliant film again. Uh, yeah, I mean it's, it's difficult because I, I was you know I thought well. I quite like Rush as well, which mm. is based on the um, the rivalry between Nicky Lauda and James Hunt. Um, We've seen Da Vinci Code. Uh, no, I haven't. No. Frost Nixon again, I think, is a, is an interesting film. So there's lots of films that you know I could have picked, but I just thought you know I picked those. Mm. So okay, nice. moving on. John, we've got we've got two left. Yeah, here. John Carpenter. Yep. So here we go. Let's go through his uh, filmography. Dark Star, Salt and Peace in 13, Halloween, Elvis, The Fog, Escape from New York, The Thing, Christine, Starman, Big Trouble in Little China, Prince of Darkness, They Live, Memoirs of an Invisible Man, In the Mouth of Madness, Village of the Damned, Escape from L.A., John Carpenter's Vampires, Ghosts and Mars, The Ward, John Carpenter's Distant Dream, John Carpenter's Escape from New York, that's a music video, sorry. Um, so, yeah, so, again, he's not particularly prolific. No. Um, his last film... It was 2010 uh, as a director. I think he's more known as as uh, for producing as well, uh, writing. Uh, he's actually wrote yeah f- few most of his films, hasn't he? Yeah. Um, he also does the, the sound the composer as well yeah. and soundtrack and write the theme tune, sing the theme tune. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you want to go first on this one? Right, because I know there's going to be two films that we both got. Yeah, here. I've got it. Yeah. If I say one, yeah. you can say the other. So I'm guessing yours is the thing. Yeah. And you have Halloween, Halloween on it. Yeah. So do you want me to cover Halloween? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So my first is is Halloween, and um, I'm a very huge fan of this film. Um, so it stars uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, it's got Donald Pleasance, who he frequently worked with as well. Yeah. But I'll go into the story. Um, in, it's set in the uh, fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois, and basically a, a killer called Michael Myers, one day when he's six years old, just decides to kill his sister for no apparent reason whatsoever. Uh, jump 15 years later to Halloween night, uh, Donald Pleasance plays Sam Loomis, who's his uh, doctor, and he's, he's uh, going to pick him up, and for whatever reason, they let the... Uh, inmates prisoners I don't know yeah. he, with the, um, he goes to Haddonfield uh, Asylum and the, they sort of let them out on the grounds Michael takes the car escapes and basically Loomis tracks him back to Haddonfield um, this is where we meet uh, Laurie Strode obviously played by Jamie Lee Curtis and uh, she is dropping off a set of keys to the Myers house where the murder happened for her dad, uh, for Strode Realty. And uh, Michael sort of sees her do this, and he just, for whatever reason, just randomly sort of just picks her out as a target. And he basically goes on a on a killing spree for no apparent reason, just the fact that he's just pure evil. Um, now, I could, I could go into all the lore and everything. I could talk for absolute hours about this, but uh, I'll go into a bit of the background. This film was made on a budget of three hundred thousand dollars, and it made seventy-eight million dollars at the box office. And for I think maybe what forty years, it was the highest-grossing uh, independent film of all time. There was no studio, big studio, that backed this. It was uh, Mustafa Cad, 
and uh, it's sort of if if Psycho was sort of the the first, I don't know if you'd call it a slasher really. If this is the definitive slasher, isn't it? You know, um, it's it's an absolute masterpiece of the genre, and I think what John Carpenter is best at is simplicity. Yes, yeah. really, all all the film is 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 about a killer that I mean it's done a it's been done a million times now, but. It's just about a killer that that for no rhyme or reason just decides to go on a killing spree in his hometown, but it's still it's it's all about execution and uh, there's a reason why John Carpenter is called the master horror and just the way he frames shots like um, it's basically the whole movie's nearly at night and you know there's scenes where they're in the house and there's like dark corners where it's just there's shadows everywhere mm-hmm. and you're like Michael's gonna be there no Michael's gonna be there you know and and it's just this film is built on suspension because yeah. he's almost um, sort of supernatural, isn't he? In the way, well, he... it's like they describe him as the boogeyman, don't they? Yeah, he's a kind of faceless, unstoppable machine. I mean, they, basically, you know, they stab him, shoot him, burn him, whatever, and he still <laughs> he still carries still on. Still carries on, and yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of your worst nightmare. Isn't yeah, he? there's no, there's really. basically no stopping him. Yeah. But for whatever reason, he, he stalks Laurie throughout the day um, till we get to night time, and he. he uh, he goes on to kill her friends and then ev- eventually tries to kill her. Um, Sam Lupus tracks him down and... Uh, should I say it, the ending? No, we could get people to watch okay. it. watch it. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just... It's all about execution with this film. And like I said, you're probably rolling your eyes thinking this has been done a million times, but this is the, the grandfather yeah. of the sl- slasher um, sort of genre. And no one expected to, this film to do well. Like I said, it was 200,000. There was times on set where... John Carpenter would, he, like I said, he wrote the film. He also composed the music for the film, which is one of the most iconic movie tracks of all time. But there was times where if he was filming a scene, he'd, he'd get a rubbish bag, paint the leaves, uh, green leaves brown because they were filming in California. They needed to make it look like it was the Midwest. They'd chuck all the leaves, set the scene, film the scene. Then another uh, cast member would, would go up, grab the bags, uh, grab the leaves, put them back in the bag, and then they do it all over again. This is this is like they were working with no budget whatsoever, and we can't talk about Halloween without talking about Michael Myers. I mean, one of the most iconic antagonists of all time, and like you said, he's just a non-stop machine. He's your worst nightmare, and just a story around the mask. Uh, he set out to find. He wanted the, the mask for Michael Myers. I believe they had a clown mask, didn't they? Um, they had various other masks, yeah. and he went to a. a Spirit Halloween or something like that one of these uh, Halloween stores and he picked up a Captain Kirk mask for two dollars and yeah, he went to his William Shatner yeah yeah, Captain Kirk Cap- yeah. yeah. So. and he, he went to his effects guy right do what you can with this and all the guy did was rip off the sideburns rip off the eyebrows widen the eyes a bit spray paint the face white and uh, spray paint the hair black and you've, you've <laughs> that's how simple mm. it was you know and I think the, the the thing that makes it so effective is that way it's like it's it's almost humanoid, but it's also not at the same time. And I think it's like this blank slate where you can just project your worst nightmares onto it, you know. And he's just an unstoppable machine. You're like, how the hell are people going to survive this, you know? Yeah. And the, the they they kind of ruin this story a bit in the other films where they sort of add in like a, a sibling thing. But in this movie, Michael just kills because he's pure evil, isn't he? Yeah. You know, and I think um, the big the big coup for them was getting Donna Pleasance. They wanted to get a respected thespian on here, and he puts in a great performance yeah. of Sam Loomis as well. Completely carries the film, but yeah, it's just Michael kills because he's evil, and it's an absolute masterpiece of the slasher genre. Completely, sort of uh, set them. What's the word? Set up the whole genre yeah, of slashes, yeah, it and it's it's the master of flat yeah. of slashes. There's never going to be a better slasher than it. It was just sort of a lightning in a bottle moment, really. The fact that it's kind of spawned so many sequels, so many um, well, uh, sequels and remakes, yeah, it? and including obviously had the final, supposedly the final one this year, Halloween, yes, yeah. which I don't know if it will be, but I mean, it yeah. inspired like Friday the Thirteenth, yeah, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, all the big ones, you know, Scream, and yeah, it's just the the the, the best slasher film there is, so. Like I said, I, I should probably stop talking because I could talk <laughs> about this stuff for hours on end, but I'll let you go into... Okay. Yeah, um, The Thing, um, starring Kurt Russell, um, who was a frequent 
Carpenter collaborator. Um, it's not a remake of the 50s. It's actually kind of like a sequel. And it's it's essentially about a, an, an Arctic outpost, research outpost. So again, it's that very isolated, claustrophobic yeah. setting. Um, this, uh, there's, they all come outside because there's... Um, there's something going on there's um basically a, a helicopter is chasing this dog trying to shoot it um they end up killing the the helicopter pilot and then i think the helicopter blows up yeah um they take the dog in and they don't realize that the dog is the thing <laughs> yeah yep. um essentially what it is it's um it's an alien organism and the original 50s thing it was kind of like a giant carrot it was, it was a, <laughs> well it was it was kind yeah. of a, a plant and it was using human blood to try and grow uh, seeds but this one is more truthful to the, the original story um, it's essentially an organism that 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 uh, enters you and, and then essentially takes over your body so anybody could be the th- completely uh, yeah takes you over and uh essentially clones you so that's that adds to the tension because anybody could be yeah. thing. um i don't really want to go into too much mm. detail because you, you really got to watch yeah. it because it is um i think it's 40th year anniversary this year um it's actually being shown in cinemas again re-released so if you get a chance to go and see it uh, and i believe they've they've released a 4k ultra edition of it uh but it is it, it's I love this film. I think it's my favourite horror film. Yeah, um, mine too. Again, I don't want to go into great detail, but it, it's just the setting. Uh, this, this sort of this, you can't escape. It's this claustrophobia. It's this paranoia that everybody could be the thing. Um, just watch it. Yeah, um, I completely agree. Uh, without giving too much away, it's it's along with you. It's my favourite horror movie of all time. It's well, I think it's we both agree that it is the Probably the best horror movie of all time, um, and we're you know we're we're very excited to be able to go see it in cinemas, aren't we? With yeah. two of those lucky oh, yeah. men. Yeah, I want to put this by you as well. Yeah, that they're, they're they're making a remake of it. Are they? Well, they did do. Um, they did a prequel, didn't they? they? Did a prequel. I think twenty eleven or something, something like, that. like that. Yeah, which I didn't think particularly worked. No, but I don't um, know. it's uh, Blumhouse, Jason oh, Blum. Okay. Who no, obviously did the Halloween. new Halloween movie, yeah. so it's probably gonna be shit in it. Nothing, <laughs> I mean, nothing uh, can ever beat it. Yeah. Um, obviously, the, the the pioneer in actual special effects and whatnot. Um, some of the best special effects you ever see. It still holds up today. The whole the movie as a whole has not dated at all, and it's a movie that will probably never never be dated at all because it's just timeless, isn't it? It's a absolute masterpiece, and if you haven't watched it. Hundred percent. Watch this film. So and there's a reason why they call John Carpenter the master of horror, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah. Okay. So, what's your? I think it's my next. Yeah, uh, yeah final one. Escape from New York. Okay. Is that on yours? No, okay. it's not. No. <laughs> oh, I wonder what's on your. Oh. <laughs> I'm generally wonder. I'm generally no, okay. curious. Um, so once again, it stars uh, Kurt Russell as as the iconic Snake Plissken, um, Donald Pleasance as the President of the United States, and it's basically in like a future dystopian society where uh, New York is now a full-on maximum security prison, the whole city of New York. Um, they chuck all the prisoners there and just let them have it. Uh, the president's heli Is it the helicopter or is it the Air Force One? I it's think it's the, the helicopter. Air Force One, isn't it? I, thought, I don't know. I'm not sure. But he, he crashes. The aircraft, his aircraft crashes in New York and Snake Plissken, who's in prison... Um, is offered by Lee Van Cleef's character, who's like the police chief, if he goes in and collects the president, I believe in 24 hours he's got or some, something like that, um, he's allowed his, his, his release. And, I mean, from the plot already, it sounds very intriguing, doesn't it? You know, the fact that New York is a full-on maximum security prison, it's basically hell there. Um, as he goes in, there's, very, um, there's people of different, like, it's almost tribal, isn't it, you know? And it's just his journey to try and retrieve the prison out of New York City, which is a maximum security prison. And like I said, it's... it's um, I think I mentioned it's Kurt Russell. Snake Plissken. Call me Snake. Yeah. Sorry. Is is one of the most iconic characters in film. Um, 
Well, you look like you want to say something. No, no, just yeah, I agree. Um, it's it's almost like a study of what happens when you, you kind of isolate a group of criminals in in a in an area, and yeah. they just yeah they sort of devolve into different groups and and I mean, it's a separate society. One scene is he's um, in a box of a wrestling match or something, mm. isn't he? Uh, against all these like weird weird people. Like I said, it's very tribal. Um, as you're on the edge of your seat, you know, his, his, his journey to try and get the present out of the stakes there. Um, once again, he, he, he composed, composed the film himself, a very good um, main title. Um, but yeah, watch the, mo- watch the movie, because it's not a, it's weird, it's, it's not like a horror movie like you'd expect from John Carpenter, but it's just a really good movie that you can just put on and have a good time with it, isn't it? So Yeah, yeah definitely. I'm intrigued to see what the film is, I, I really don't know. <laughs> Um, it's They Live. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. That makes so much yeah. sense. Yeah. Which is an action horror sci fi thriller starring wow. Rowdy Roddy Piper. <laughs> Legend. Of uh, WWE or F as it was back then. Um, yeah, he, he, Rowdy Roddy plays um, a down on his luck construction worker. He discovers a pair of special sunglasses and wearing them, he can see that some of usually normal looking people are in fact aliens in charge of a massive campaign to keep humans subdued through basic subliminal messaging in like the media, things like stay asleep, no imagination, submit to authority. So it's basically aliens are in, in control and trying to subdue humans in this fight to um to try and stop that. Um that's basically it. Yeah, <laughs> that's all you can sort I mean, of hey, say. All you need is is Rowdy Roddy Piper, yeah. mate. You know, I'm probably one of the greatest lines yep. in history. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubble, bubble gum. gum. So what more do you want? You need to watch this. Yeah, film, just go and watch it. It is, it is what it is. You know, it's not going to win any Oscars, I don't think, but it's just an enjoyable um, action film. Yeah, essentially. Uh, again, it's kind of a bit of a feel-good film. Yeah, once again, well. you can just put it on and have a good time yeah. with it, isn't it? You know, you don't need um, to think about it too much. No. Uh, so that's yeah. that's all there is really to say yeah. about it. I don't think there's any anything else. Just a little um, little honourable mention. I've got big trouble in little yeah. China. That's yeah, another banger. Another one, yeah. Kurt Russell. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to our last director, and I wonder who this is going to be the most <laughs> prolific director, Senor Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> Um, How long do we have for Steve Spielberg? Spielberg? Right, so here we go. I'm going to try and do it in one go without having <laughs> yeah. to take a breath. Jewel, some uh, Jewel, Sugarland Express, Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 1941, Razor Lost Out, ET Extraterrestrials, Twilight Zone, Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom, The Color Purple, Empire of the Sun, Indiana Jones, Last Crusade, Always, Hulk, Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, The Lost World, Jurassic Park, Amistad, Saving Private Ryan. AI, Artificial Intelligence, Minority Report, Catch Me If You Can, The Terminal, Munich, Indiana Jones, The King of Crystal Skull, The Adventures of Tintin, War Horse, Lincoln, Bridge of Spies, BFG, The Post, Ready Player One, West Side Story, Marcus Mumford, that was a can- that was a music video shot, and The Fablemans. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to leave the best for last. Okay, I know what you're going to... You're going to know it's going to yep. be... And it's like again, I read it and I'm like, oh, I don't know, I really don't know what to mm. what to pick because there's so many great films. Yeah. Uh, but I'm gonna start with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Not mine. Not on yours. Okay. Mm. All right. So it's an introduction of Indiana Jones. If you've not seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, where have you been? Yep. <laughs> Come on. Sure, really? <laughs> it's um, the love child of Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. Them two definitely loved each other. Yeah. Let's face yeah. it. Um, and they kind of propose this. It's almost like a Saturday morning comic book serial about a an archaeolo- an archaeology professor by day who's kind of a grave robber, <laughs> antiquity hunter by night. Um, he wears a leather jacket, fedora hat, and a whip. So it's a bit, <laughs> you, know, you try selling that to a studio, <laughs> but it is it. it 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 just works. I think it's just yep. amazing. And I think it, it is that kind of... Um, it takes you back to when you were a kid and you watch those kind of action serials or action programs or whatever. Um, it's set in the 30s. He's fighting the Nazis. He's It adds in a bit of mythology because he's, he's been at, he's sent to, dis, uh, to actually retrieve the Ark of the Covenant, which the Nazis are, are looking for. He travels all over the world, gets into fights, uh, f- blows up a plane, 
um, chases a, a lorry on a horse in the <laughs> desert, and what more do you want? No, it's just, you know. Um, again, it's. I just think it's it's one of those films that I can put on and watch. It's it, again, it's just a feel good film, I yep. think, as well. Um, and it's got one of the, I think one of the best. I think we it was one of our best opening sequences, yeah. and also plot twist as well, because the film is essentially a, a build up to a punchline right at the end. Yeah, I'm not going to spoil it for you. If you haven't watched it, watch it because it, it is a fantastic film. Yeah, it's, it's basically the the premier action adventure movie isn't it you yeah. know what more can you say it and it, you know Indiana Jones has now become an iconic character yeah. one of the yeah. most iconic protagonists yeah. and Harrison Ford was is the perfect person to play yeah. Indiana Jones you know he's basically playing himself yeah. really isn't he you know <laughs> but yeah like one with certain films it's like we we can sit here and talk about it all day but some films you just gotta sit down and watch for yourself yeah. and experience you know um, I bet you were quite surprised at that Raiders on there no, well, no I was yeah my first is Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Okay. Just joking, last question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no one said, no one's going to say Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. But I can I just say, for all you people who say that Indy had no like impact on the plot, fuck you. Next, it's Last Crusade. So, okay. We move on to that. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. <laughs> um, do you have it on your... Pent up uh, frustration. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, no, and Last Crusade no. isn't on my... I, tr- I try to pick one film from each kind okay, of okay that's fair enough franchise or whatever you want to call it I hate calling it franchise but there you go yeah but, yeah one C- series or whatever well while I consider uh, Rage of the Lost Ark the best as a film um, Last Crusade is my favourite by far I love. I absolutely love this film it's not far off Raiders at all no. really is it you know? again it's it's one of my favourite I think Raiders obviously introduced the character yeah. and started you know had Raiders been a favourite flop we would never have got Last Crusade. No, so so it, it kind of it starts off with a young indie, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Which is something we've not seen before. River Play, Phoenix, yeah, River Phoenix. Um, uh, as it's his like sort of journey to try and find the Cross of Coronado. Yep, yep. Um, and we get a little nice sequence of him getting it, and then uh, he has to give it back to these uh, sort of diggers or archaeologists, fellow archaeologists. Film starts with him. Uh, sort of getting back the cross and then we go into the actual plot um, uh, I believe is uh, Julian Glover isn't it who plays uh, Donovan so going back to the, the opening scene it kind of explains where he gets his fear of snakes from his okay. scar on his on yeah, his probably should have included that you know? and also uh, where he gets his whole look from yeah because the, the main sort of grave robber guy who steals the cross of Coronado dressed exactly like Actually, from the back when you first see him, you think it's him, think don't it's you? Him, but he's not. So, and that's where you get. That's where you get. Yeah. He gets his famous his, hat from. His hat and his whole overall look from. Yeah. Yeah. But moving on to, it's a very religious film, isn't it? It's very yeah. um, compared to the others. Like iconography in it. Yeah. yeah very yeah. Christian, isn't it? Um, but basically, going into the the actual plot of the movie, uh, Donovan, played by Julian Glover, um, he hired uh, Henry Jones Senior. Uh, played by the great Sean Connery, yeah. rest in peace. So, who else could play Indiana Jones? His father, father exactly apart from James Bond. So, <laughs> yeah. I think Spielberg wanted to actually direct a Bond film, didn't he? Yeah. So it's kind of next best thing, I suppose, is directing Bond. Oh, he was perfect for the role, wasn't he? Yeah. But um, he basically he he is the guy. He's a specialist of the Holy Grail. Um, he has the Grail Diary, which is is all of his uh, research and into the Holy Grail, where its its actual location is because it's not known. He goes missing, and so he goes to the next best person, which is uh, Henry Jones Jr. Obviously, don't call me Jr. Um, Indiana Jones, as you know. So he hires him. Um, first, Indy goes out on this li- like sort of side adventure to get to try and find his his father, and he's being held in a uh, Nazi castle, isn't Castle Grunwald on the Austrian Jim border, I think it is. See, he knows a lot more than me, yeah. but. Uh, um, <laughs> You, know, you might as well just explain because you, you can explain way better than me. Well, basically, um, Henry Senior, his his diary um, is uh, essentially tells them where the Grail's being yeah. kept, but there's no like there's no names on it or anything. Um, so uh, Indy rescues uh, Henry Jones Senior. I just call him Henry from the yeah. one, uh, and they go off to. Um, 
they they go off to uh, recover the Grail, but before they have to go have a little side journey to yep. to Berlin because the, the Grail diary has been sent to Berlin, and um, it's got details in there that they need. So they actually get to meet Hitler, who I think signs the Grail diary yep. for them. <laughs> Which is a little side note. Anyway, so they end up um, they end up finding. Um, but I think they're actually beaten to it, aren't they? They're at the resting place, the Grail. Yeah. Um, and they have to... Rec- uh, the Nazis shoot Henry, so Indy has to go after the Grail, um, recovers it, um, cures Henry using it, but then one of the one of the things of immortality, because the Grail gives you immortality, so they said that, shouldn't they? <laughs> they meet one of the um, Knights Templar who's guarding... The, but one of the... Um, burdens of immortality is that they cannot cross the grates, they cannot actually leave the, the resting, seal. Yeah, cross the seal, leave the actual uh, resting place, the grail. So, um, yeah, that's essentially it. And the grail is actually lost in the end. Yeah. But I think this, the message at the end is they lose the grail, but they kind of refight because they've lost Indy and his father, they've sort of fallen out, they've lost touch, but they actually reconnect and they yeah. find each other. So, it's more about the journey. Yeah, it's more it? about the journey and the, and their relationship than it is about actually recovering the Grail. But yeah, like I said, it's, it's very religious, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um, and I think I think the reason why I, I just love this one so much is because there's um, a lot more emotion and stakes at the end, especially like um, when Indy has to go and retrieve the actual uh, Grail itself. There's um, three sort of stages he has to pass, isn't it? You yeah. know. Um, I believe it's it's the the kneeling, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, was it the breath of God, the word of God, and the leap of faith, or something? I can't remember. So there's like these stages he has yeah. to do. Should uh, do some more research. I yeah. Think. Oh well, <laughs> we're real. Watch we? the film, all right? Come on, watch it. Okay. Yeah, watch the film. It's brilliant, um, uh, very emotional, and I think it has one of John Williams' best, best, best themes of all time in the Penitent and Man Will Pass. Like that, hearing that shit will bring you to tears. Um, we got, we took the long way round to, to describe the film, yeah. but you know, we got yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I said, it's about the journey, not yeah. about the end, isn't it? So. Watch the film. Or I didn't describe it very well, but yeah, watch the film. It's, it is. Yeah, I think it probably is the best of the actual Indiana Jones films. Yeah. But I just chose Raiders because that was the original, yeah. the OG, and the start of the the whole thing. Uh, right. Well, I don't know. I, I just I can't really <laughs> choose. What do you guys think? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to go for Jurassic Park, I think. Yeah. Really? That surprises you, does it? Not a certain movie in 1975? No, no, that is my last one. This is my second oh, one. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, just a little crumbs oh, there yeah, for okay. the audience, sorry. <laughs> um, I, th- I think just Jurassic Park just revolutionised filmmaking obviously yep. with CGI um, I mean you look at it now and it's a little bit it looks a little bit dated obviously date, sorry dated they didn't use a lot of CGI in the film they still had to use practical effects as well but I think it still stands up oh, yeah. as, a, as a great film um, it's essentially what, it, what it's about is um, John Hammond he's a, a sort of billionaire venture capitalist he's building Essentially, an island in uh, off of Costa Rica. Oh, it's not building that. He's leased an island off Costa Rica. He's essentially building a theme park, and he's bringing back dinosaurs, cloning dinosaurs from DNA uh, that they recovered in trapped in in mosquitoes yeah. in amber. In amber, yep. That's essentially the story. Um, there's been a few accidents where uh, workers have died. So, in order for them to get on back on track they they've been asked to bring in some specialists just to to sign off on the park uh so that is sam neill's character is alan grant laura dern plays ellie statler and jeff goldblum as dr ian malcolm um and then what happens is uh there's a little side story dennis nedry who's the computer programmer he plans to steal some of the embryos give them to a rival um there's a storm he turns off all the fences dinosaurs get loose um, and that's essentially the, the story mm. 
Uh, yeah, like I said, it's, it's this thing everyone knows Jurassic Park, don't they? Um, well, they should do, yeah. Yeah, definitely. you should do. You know, if you, I don't know literally where you've been if you haven't seen this film. Um, it was the highest, it was, broke the world box office records when it came out. Still such a relevant film nowadays. And just going back to the CGI, um, obviously it was 1993. Um, of course, they didn't have access to the best technology, but for, for what they had, it, it still stands up today. But what, what um, Spielberg did is he knew how and when to use CGI. So, you know, he used like uh, animatronics as well, even for the dino- mm. even for the T-Rexes, he used well, animatronics. They only used CGI when they couldn't use practical yeah. effects, I think, which makes a difference. Well, like what, what he did is, is he is he made sure to use the CGI when it was dark, when it was raining, so you, it kind of takes your eye off of, or you can't fully see what the models were. Um, but yeah, it's just an absolute iconic film, isn't it? One of the biggest films yeah. ever. You know, this is, we're talking big, 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 big blockbusters, isn't we? Yeah. Um, obviously, Again, spawn sequels and yeah, remakes. And- I've never touched the original, <laughs> but um, obviously the, the original, it was based on a book by Michael Crichton, yeah, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. He's of course a great director as well. Um, John Williams, brilliant score yeah. as well, iconic. So yeah, uh, like I said, if you nothing else, if you if, if you haven't watched this movie, where have you been? Yeah, so absolute one of his best. Okay, so yeah, what's your next one? Is that the same as my last one? Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. If you've ever listened to us before, then we probably bring those up in every podcast, <laughs> whatever. It's my favourite film by far. I think of all time is Jaws. Um. What can you say? If you haven't seen Jaws, where you've been? You've been living on a planet or yeah. in prison or something. I don't know what it should be. Um, it's a simple story based on a, a story by Peter Benchley about a great white shark. Um, it stakes its claim off Amity Island, kills a few people. The chief, police chief uh, Brody, played by Roy Scheider, um, he wants to shut the beaches and kill the shark. The Murray Hamilton, who plays the mayor, he wants to keep the beaches open because obviously that's the lifeblood of their, their town. If they shut, shut the beaches, they, they face financial ruin. Um, so it's that kind of, there's a battle between them. He's trying to battle the mayor and also trying to get the sh- capture the shark. And in the end, um, when there's an incident that where somebody's killed uh, and it involves his son, is is traumatised by it as well. That's Brody's son. Um, the mayor agrees to hire Quint, played by the great Robert Shaw, to go out and kill the shark and he's accompanied by Brody and also Matt Hooper who is played by uh, Richard Dreyfus um, as the, he's a shark expert uh, and that's essentially so it's, it's kind of in a two part you've got the build up to the, the actual whole thing and then the second part is the, the hunt for the shark and the eventual or spoiler alert they kill the shark <laughs> But it's just it's got everything it's got adventure it's got thrills it's got tension it's got action it's got adventure um an iconic soundtrack by again by john williams um just there's nothing about this film that i can that i can fault again it's one of those films where the the actual making of it is is a little bit maybe as interesting as the film itself you know the the famous problems that they had with the mechanical shark um the is that it, obviously the shark wasn't working for a lot of the time you know he had to improvise by using like the barrels and other things so a lot of the scenes you see where the shark's there you don't actually see the shark which actually adds to yeah. the tension i think because it's it's that fear of the unknown and i've got to say right whenever i go in the sea that's mm. always in the back of my yeah. mind that there could be a shark and it's there. all stemmed from this film yeah, isn't it exactly yeah. and it was the first big summer blockbuster yeah. uh, films weren't usually released in summertime um, and it, this was I think it was July it was released and it became just absolutely phenomenal made shit loads of money um, and I think we just set Spielberg up as a great director yeah really um, I don't think there's anything more to say um, the only thing I can add to that is is um, as as much as I love the film, I also respect it for what it's done for modern cinema. Like you said, it was the first action uh, summer blockbuster. Yeah. Um, it broke all the world box office records, and um, yeah, well, just the amount before of, Star Wars. Yeah, before <laughs> Star Wars, just yeah. There's no competition no, on Star Wars, but, but yeah. no, just the, the amount of hell they went through to try and get this film made, 
and they they made an absolute masterpiece of a thriller out of it. So yeah, I completely respect this yeah, film. And I can watch this any time. I was fortunate enough to we've we've seen this film I think twice in the cinema in the last yep. year, the original version and then a three D version. Uh, I've got to see the IMAX version yet, but <laughs> I so mate, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's it's just a film that I can watch any time. Yeah, and still, you know, it's still um, I still love it. Still holds up, you know. Still, yeah. um, it will be we, say a hundred years time. We'll look back to this film, man. It's so just it's it, how great it is, but it's importance for cinema itself, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah, and it, and it, it arguably started the the yeah. The career of one of the greatest yeah. directors ever. I mean, there's been lots of shark films since then that all kind of draw on um, this film as as a blueprint. Well, obviously, Sharknado, you know, <laughs> and all that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so anything else to? No, no, once again, what, what can you? What else can you say about Jaws? Uh, nothing. I don't think it's just watch it. Yeah, if you 100%. haven't seen it before, where have you been? <laughs> another one. Another one. I do have a moment to mention because yeah. there's so many. Uh, another one that I wanted to get in here was Shinner's List. Yeah. Um, okay. I know you've you've have you seen it before? Yeah. Yep. Um, I th- think it was probably just by looking at a film standpoint, it's probably his his best film as in terms of um, the actual film itself. Um, it's very. It was. It, I'm not going to go into detail because it's just honorable mention, mm. but yeah, just Schindler's List deserves to be there because it's always revered as one of the best films ever made. It was very personal to him because I believe he's Jewish as well, and it's obviously yeah. about Oscar Schindler yeah. and um, about how he, how he single handedly helped release uh, over 1,000 Jews in, in uh, the Holocaust and World War Two. Mm. But yeah, I'm not going to go into detail, yeah. but I, f- I think should have that as an honourable mention yeah, I mean, so many great films of yeah. that I could have chosen oh, this thing as well you've got like Catch Me If You yeah. Can and what not you know. Private Ryan yeah. and yeah, just yes E.T. you know it's just, never ending yeah, isn't it you know. exactly um, I think he'll, he'll probably go down as one of the greatest directors yeah 100% uh, certainly the most prolific I think yeah um, no one ever will do what he, he would do no. the amount of movies and the amount of good movies mm. he's made yeah that's the thing is being consistent as yeah. well um, you can be a director and you can have some really good movies and some really shit ones and I think he's consistently produced really good films kept the bar there yep exactly so yeah so there we are bit of an epic ourselves but <laughs> <laughs> we got to there at the end all that's left for me to say is thank you for, for listening and, and hope to see you again soon thank you very much thank you bye